First question. Hi, I'm Lise Weiger from the Ethics Center. Um, it's a real privilege uh, to hear your remarks and observations on this, so thank you so much for being with us. I was curious if we step back from just the U.S. context. Uh, are there models in other countries that the U.S. could be looking at about how they deal with the same issues? It's particularly common law countries that have similar uh, trial systems. Well, I, I, I can tell you one thing, that is that, that when a society gets to the point where it's approaching the ideal of Gideon, there is always serious political pushback. I shouldn't say always because I only have two examples. One is here in Massachusetts, uh, where starting two years ago, there was quite a heavy pushback. Um, uh, why are we spending so much money? Um, and, uh, and it's happening now in England, which is really the paradigm, it's really the model, this station house representation, which is a wonderful idea. Uh, the uh, uh, defendant can choose his or her attorney from eligible lists or qualifications. Uh, there is review of performance. Um, and it's under heavy attack right now because it's too expensive. Uh, I think the British system is an excellent one. Um, and uh, uh, I don't actually, the, I, I, I don't know it firsthand. I know it mostly through my friend Norm Lestein, who's written about it and, and, and visited it. And I think it's a little bureaucratic in terms of the size of their administrative oversight. I don't think one needs to be quite as top heavy uh, as, it, as at least it was a few years ago. Uh, but I think that's a system that, 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 that is worth emulating. Thank you. All right, uh, my name is Alex. I'm a senior here, and I'm actually going to law school next year, so I hope to learn a lot more about those things. Uh, but uh, in a few states in the United States, I think Washington and Missouri, as far as I know, the Supreme Courts there, the state Supreme Courts, recently ruled that certain public defender caseloads were, did not constitute meaningful representation because they sort of overburdened the public defender. So I was wondering if you thought that, A, this was you know actually justified, and if you think that there's any chance that the Supreme Court could actually take up this issue in the future. Justice Osbert? Because um, the answer to your second <clears throat> question is probably not in the sense that um, um, unless there were a sort of sea change in thinking, but because the, the um, funding of the commitment to provide lawyers is affirmatively a state function and within the state it even gets divided up. I, I have trouble seeing the U.S. Supreme Court thinking that there, there would be a federal constitutional right to something that would get down to the level of figuring out case loads. But, but um, I do think that uh, Bill could speak to this a lot better than I, but it, it does seem to me that at the state level which these were obviously state Supreme Courts, um, taking the time and energy to look at that question, I applaud, and I think that it probably does make a huge difference in terms of the quality of representation. But I... Well, I, I, I'd like to, uh, uh, it, it's not much fun to agree. I agree with your second point, so I want to disagree with your first point so, and, and, and put a little spice in here. I, 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 I do think that if you start with the, with the, with the, um, uh, the notion that what the Constitution requires is not just a lawyer, you know, a proverbial potted plant, but effective advocacy, that the right to counsel has to be the effective assistance of counsel or it does not comply with the constitutional mandate. Then I think you can find your way. Uh, it would take an egregious state uh, to, be, to, to be sued. Uh, but I do think, I, I would not close the door on a Gideon II at the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and I think there are frankly more than a few state candidates for the role of defendant. Uh, it will take a, a smarter brain than mine uh, to figure out uh, the litigation strategy and the constitutional nuances and avoiding abstention by the federal courts. Um, and it might even proceed through a state court uh, where, it, where, the, where the top state court uh, refuses to uh, address the obvious deficiencies. Um, and so, but there are plenty of smart people and, and organizations peopled by smart people around in this, in this country. That is not something we have a shortage of. 
Um, and uh, I think that, uh, I, I, I hope that the kind of uh, thinking that I see in our soon-to-be law student uh, is reflected throughout the profession, because I think that's the kind of spirit that led to Betts versus Brady being overruled. After only 21 years, let's not forget, it was not an ancient case. Um, and um, uh, so I, I'd like to think that that, uh, that, that kind of litigation is, uh, has some potential. Hi, my name is Jason. I'm a sophomore, and I'm also planning on going to law school after Brandeis. And I just want to tag off of what you said about like the 500, you know, I mean, the public defender is taking on 500 cases at once, and they can't even handle their caseloads anymore. So I think we've been seeing a big problem in this country where it's just not enough people are entering the public service because a lot of like a lot of lawyers after graduating, they want to enter the uh, very lucrative positions in the big law firms rather than serving in an underserved community or in, the, or in the government office. So I know this is probably going to be a pretty difficult question, but what would you say is the better solution in a sense, or the, uh, you know, yeah, the better solution to solving our problem? Nobody wants to bite on that one. Uh, you know, I, I think not, not everything can be solved by money, but a lot of things can be solved by resources. Um, and where you talk about you know, the, the levels of compensation that are necessary for people to do appropriate work as, as criminal defense lawyers or as assigned lawyers on, uh, uh, on criminal justice uh, panels, most of these people who are doing this uh, are, are not, not doing it to make huge amounts of money. And they are doing it out of a commitment to a number of things, including uh, working through the process. But for many of them, it's very hard just to make it work. And to a certain extent, you know, it's, you're forcing them into the Hobson's choice of having to be able to prepare the case faster just because of the compensation that they're going to have for it. And a number of my friends from uh, who I serve in the U.S. Attorney's Office with are now on the criminal defense side. Um, and some of them have very lucrative practices, but a lot of them do a, a high level of assigned practice cases. And it is very hard for them to practice law to their standards doing that, um, the way in which those cases are, are compensated. Uh, by the way, some of that has to do with Congress. Um, we've kind of given the judiciary a pass here, um, not the state judiciary here, of course, it deserves a pass, um, but, the, but the federal judiciary who sits on, uh, on, on passing on some of the, the fee uh, petitions that lawyers put in. And there's actually quite a bit of pushback to conserve some of those funds. So I think there has to be an overall sense that these are going to be treated the way regular cases are, and ask lawyers to really be able to defend clients vigorously with the zealously within the balance of the law. But I'll come back to what Bill said. That is a very expensive operation. So I'm not sure the problem is the paucity of people who want to go into this. I think there are plenty of people who are happy to look for ways of practicing law, and they're finding it very difficult to make it work this way. Go. The, uh, the further answer to your question is that it, it, there's, there's not a problem attracting people to public defender work. Uh, the problem is retaining them over time uh, as people uh, consider families and starting their own families and so forth. Uh, and surprisingly, I, I, I agree with the president uh, that, that it's not all about money. It's about what kind of institution is, is built uh, to provide the services. I'm going to throw out an example that might surprise people. Kentucky. Kentucky devotes not nearly enough money to its public defender system, but because they've had oh, three or four decades now of good, strong, humane, committed leaders, they've built an esprit de corps that makes their system I don't know how many times better than it should be by any cost investment kind of analysis. And people stay in an organization like that because they feel like they're doing meaningful work uh, with uh, devoted colleagues. Uh, and so they're part of something important that's larger than themselves. Um, and, and, and in places where that kind of organization exists, that's an independent major variable in addition to whether it's sufficiently funded uh, uh, so that uh, you can retain people for enough, a, a significant enough period of time so that they can have Fred Turner type savvy when they go into the courtroom and their clients, uh, their clients can have confidence in their, in their representation. Thank you. 
Hi, yeah, I'm David, I'm also a sophomore here, and we've talked a lot about the criminal justice system, which I agree is probably the most important thing to be talking about. But I know a few of you have mentioned the civil justice system, maybe people filing for injunctive relief or trying to sue on behalf of themselves or various other entities. And I was wondering if any of you think that there is a right or ought to be a right to have meaningful representation when acting as perhaps a plaintiff in this type of suit, or if you think there's political will for it, or sort of how that might add to the political movement for better criminal services, or maybe even take away will for that. So just sort of wondering for opinions on that. being put into what is known as the Civil Gideon Movement to, to figure out ways to provide a right to a lawyer in a variety of civil contexts. Um, um, so far, I would say, uh, the effort has not achieved great legal success. I, I think where, where we have ended up extending the right to have lawyers represent um, uh, people in civil cases, it's at least taking, taking this state as an example, it, it has come either because of court rules sometimes requires it, or statutes require it and then a court will build off of that. But the Supreme Court, uh, the US Supreme Court, um, some years ago sort of put a kibosh on, I think, uh, at least for a while, uh, the idea of, of really developing a constitutional right to a lawyer in a civil, in a civil setting. So I, I think if the, the effort continues, uh, it certainly does strongly, I think, in many states. But I, I have trouble at the moment seeing that it is going to achieve a breakthrough United States Supreme Court um, a success. There was a case in 2011 that the United States Supreme Court uh, decided where, it's funny because it, 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 the, the first first of your examples out of the art, the Bronner article, yeah. which was a criminal, uh, the, the, the Georgia person who spent a lot of time in jail yep. um, as a criminal lack, not paying child support. <coughs> well, the, the US Supreme Court case was a fellow who spent actually even longer in jail, but who had been held in civil contempt for not paying child support. And the issue was whether he was entitled to counsel because he was facing jail in this civil context. And the United States Supreme Court said in that case, no, right to counsel is not there. There's a due process right that requires the state to do things in terms of the proceeding, but not having a right to counsel. So. I seem to be the wet blanket on about everything. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's an, I think better minds than mine are are sticking to this, are are trying to come up with creative ways to push the civil Gideon to into new places, and I applaud that. Um, I think it's um, uh, the jury's out on, what, on where and when and how it will succeed. My own view on that, just for a second, is um, I used to work at Greater Boston Legal Services, uh, and every Thursday uh, up in the housing court, Boston Housing Court is what's uh, known among the lawyers as eviction day. And whether you're planning on going to law school or not, I, I recommend that you go down to the Suffolk County Courthouse and go up to the Boston Housing Court on Thursday. And what you see is scores of families, young children in parents' arms, lined up out the door of the courtroom because there are more than 100 eviction trials scheduled for that day. Two judges, virtually no lawyers. The landlords are represented by counsel, virtually no counsel for indigent uh, families facing eviction. Some of the representation for those families falls on uh, the bar. Greater Boston Legal Services is a fantastic organization. There are pro bono lawyers from large firms, medium-sized firms, small firms throughout the Greater Boston area that donate time from lawyers who work in private practice. But if you are concerned about public service, then Go down there and, and take a look and see the importance to society. It may not be a criminal case, but there's this crying need for, uh, I'll call it justice, 
uh, in the context, the non-criminal, but the context of eviction. Can I just add something yeah. about that? Um, I do think that in the absence of a right to counsel, what states have done, and um, the Boston Housing Court is a good example, is uh, put a lot of pressure, uh, appropriate pressure, on <coughs> courts and court staff to develop ways that are much more uh, user-friendly, uh, that are more competent at dealing with self-represented litigants. In the Boston Housing Court, for example, there is a whole staff of court personnel who mediate the cases and try to come to solutions rather than go to trial. There are, the bar steps in and, and volunteer lawyers for the day in a variety of courts. So I was really only addressing a sort of constitutional right to a lawyer in a, in a civil, I mean, there are in some few instances, but, but, but mostly it is trying to fill in around the edges and provide either counsel or court processes that are gonna make uh, the procedures more understandable and more, as I say, user-friendly for uh, self-represented litigants. Mm -hmm. Let's take one more question before I ask Tony Lewis to sum up for us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Sam Zuckernick. I'm also a sophomore here. And uh, it's been made clear that it's not just so much of having a lawyer who's kind of a figurehead, but someone who kind of really understands your case and understands you as a person. So um, my question is, what could be done to keep retention rates high for these qualified public defendants instead of just a constant stream of new public defendants? Sure, you want to talk about that? Is there a great turnover? Uh, what's the turnover like? In well, again, yeah, it, 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 it depends on, on, on certainly salary structure is, is important. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I've uh, started recognizing and speaking about is the two-tier system of providing counsel in the United States depending on whether the case is in federal court or in state court. And the federal court is, in general, pre-sequester at least, uh, an exception. Uh, to the widespread criticism uh, that, that counsel does not perform well under the Gideon principle in the state and local courts. Uh, because by and large, the federal system, is, you know, salaries are much higher, the hourly rates are much higher if it's a private counsel appointment. Um, it also has a lot to do, as I mentioned earlier, with the type of institution and whether there's an esprit de corps and a purpose and an energy. It has to do with your judicial system. Massachusetts, to not to be overly kind, but Massachusetts has a judicial system where you get a fair hearing uh, and a sophisticated uh, decision if, you, if you're lucky enough to get up to the, uh, to the upper levels of the appellate uh, judiciary. That can't be said of every state. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of uh, factors uh, that, that go into it. And uh, the other point I would make is the need for standards. Uh, and and uh, uh, when I talk about that there should be federal funding to support the state uh, implementation of Gideon, I really mean that that is for states which are uh, meeting minimal standards. New York, amazingly, when I got there two years ago, did not have statewide standards uh, that were binding on indigent representation cases. Uh, we do now. Now, making them enforceable and meaningful is, you know, the next decade or so of work. Uh, but so standards are very important. It's a dry stuff, but it's it's extremely important because there has to be a, a baseline level of representation uh, without which you, you know, un under which you cannot draw. Uh, 